My name is Greg Morse. I'm the president of the Chamber of Commerce here in Situate. I'd like to welcome our candidates. I'd like to welcome you from the audience. Today, this is going to be a televised event. It is being recorded. Um, candidates, if you can speak loudly and clearly toward the camera, which is central in the back of the room, we appreciate it. I want to start off by, by thanking the Village Market and the East Coast Press for providing uh, our paper materials, providing our food. We do have coffee on the way. It'll be here shortly. I'll make an announcement when it comes. <laughs> 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 yeah. The Citroen Chamber had a strong 2014. As always, one of our major priorities is continuing an effort to present our business owners, residents, and community education and information regarding town politics. The Chamber works tirelessly to improve the communication and cohesion between Situate's residents and our business community. The Chamber's mission is to provide smart and effective commercial, retail, and business growth for our town. One way in which we do that is this candidate form, by providing our members and community with information about current town candidates the Chamber hopes to help our town and our business community make informed decisions about their future leaders. We strongly believe an informed community makes better decisions, which spurs responsible, intelligent growth to our commercial base, increases our businesses, and makes it our town a better place to live, work, and play. I'd like to thank our candidates for being here today and supporting the business community and for their efforts to make this town a better place to live. Regardless of winning or losing, the Chamber appreciates your involvement and hopes that our town can count on your continued efforts moving forward in so many other areas where resident and business involvement are crucial to success. Today's forum is going to be moderated by Nancy Murray Young. Nancy first served on the Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors from 1979 to 1981. In 1980, she was the first woman to be elected to our board as vice president of the chamber. And in that role, she was the first woman to uh, chair the Heritage Days Festival that we sponsor every year. She served on the board again from 1999 to 2005, in which time she established our Excellence in Business Awards. Our event today is not a debate, it is a forum. The major difference is that our candidates are not here to engage each other. They are here to present the public of their goals, their hopes, and views, and their experiences so that you, our voters, can ultimately make a better informed decision on election day. The format will include a couple of questions from the Chamber of Commerce interspersed with written and submitted questions from the audience. Um, we do have pads of paper at the back of the room, probably as, as well amongst the audience. If you have questions, we ask that you write them down and bring them up here to this table where we'll direct them through Nancy and the candidates. We have gotten a number of questions already. Many of them are duplicate. If you don't hear your exact question, hopefully it's because we have one very similar to it in the pile. Uh, the candidates will each have up to two minutes to respond to each question. After the response uh, of each candidate, if a candidate has additional information or would like to clarify something, we've provided them with an index card you can raise, and that will give you an additional 30 seconds at the end uh, to provide additional clarification. The goal of this format is to deliver positive, neutral information to our audience. Again, not to directly engage other candidates. Therefore, any candidate at any time which seems to target another candidate in an attempt to disparage one's character or experience, the moderator will ask them to stop and hold their remarks. Once again, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here today. Here's Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. This is the only time I'll stand up because I'm really not much taller standing <laughs> than I am sitting. And I, I wanted to thank the Chamber um, for inviting me to moderate this. This is a very exciting campaign for me personally as someone who's always been interested in situate politics. Um, it is so exciting to have four candidates for this seat, and I think that that really says to me we're starting to get interested in our community again when for so off, you know so long we haven't had candidates and there's a good reason for that I think because these are volunteer positions 
these people, uh, you know, there isn't enough money that you could pay them to do what they do, which is why they really don't get any money. Um, you know, it's, it's, so if you don't know, it's, it's not a day at the beach to be a, a public official, particularly a selectman, and particularly in these very difficult times. So I just want to add a little bit to what Greg said about the format. I'm going to have the uh, opening statements in alphabetical order ascendingly, beginning with Mrs. Kern and through the alphabet. Um, when we begin to answer the questions, I will rotate the order in which people begin to answer so that everyone has a chance to answer the question first, second, et cetera. Um, I would like to ask you if, uh, if you feel compelled to applaud, if you would hold your applause until a candidate is done speaking because they're on very tight time constraints and if you applaud and we can't hear them, that kind of you know, mitigates some of what they're saying. So I would ask you to do that um, as well. And um, I do have a lot of questions here. And again, because there are time constraints, we won't get to all of them, but we're hoping that the candidates will stay after for a little while, and you can too, and ask them some questions if you didn't have your issue addressed. So, thank you again for being here. This is a wonderful time. And thank you to the Chamber for sponsoring this. And we're going to begin with um, opening statements, and as I said, I'll begin with more. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Greg, and thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event. And most importantly, thank you to all of you. This is a great turnout, which the television camera can't see, and surely is indicative of the amount that all of you care about this town, in addition to the way in which the four candidates do as well. Um, as Nancy had mentioned, my name is Maura Curran. I have lived in Citric for the past 20 years, and during those 20 years, I've spent probably more than half of them dedicating my time on a variety of boards to try to make a difference in this town. Um, my husband and I have raised two daughters who have gone through the Situate public school system, and um, I work full time for a global office products company. So I hope to take the experience that I've gained working on behalf of a variety of different constituencies throughout town, take that experience and that knowledge, and leverage it um, to hit the ground running as your next board of selectmen. Situate is an incredibly compassionate community. Um, and I hope to take that compassion and bring us all together, all the various interests in town, and move forward in one concise fashion. And that's what I hope to deliver as your next board of selectmen. And I look forward to the rest of all the morning. Thank you. Oh, I, I was just, I was okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I came next, Elf, <laughs> My name is Marilyn Ward Howe, and I own and operate Sands End Cafe in Amarok. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to my little cafe, it's a small cafe on the left in a 110-year-old building. We have a bakery on premises and a gift store as well. Previous to owning Sands End, I was a high school teacher. I taught accounting, entrepreneurship, marketing. While I was in high school, I was also the DECA advisor. And for those of you who are not familiar with DECA, it's uh, a business community within the high school that encourages our kids to develop their business skills. And we compete on a state level. And in the event that our kids do well, we go on to a national level. Uh, in the two years that I taught at Silver Lake Regional High School, I was able to bring my team to a national level, once in Nashville, Tennessee, and once out in Anaheim, California. So I'm very, uh, very proud of that achievement as a high school teacher. Um, additionally, I have my MBA. I got my MBA a few years, well, several years ago, from Western New England College, uh, now Western New England University. I have a bachelor's degree of arts in English as well. That was from Western Connecticut State <laughs> University. Um, I'm the proud mother of two very successful 29-year-old twin daughters. And I have never run for political office before. I've never been involved in any of the committees in Situate. And uh, win or lose, it would certainly be my goal, after having learned what I've learned heretofore, to be involved on some level in politics going forward because I have learned 
a tremendous amount about Situate in the short time that I've really been engaged in this political process. Um, and understandably, there's much, much more for me to learn. But I'm very proud to be part of this process. It is um, an unprecedented time that there would be four people running for a six-month term. <laughs> and uh, I, I admire the spirit of all the four of us. But, uh, just as Nancy said, that speaks to the fact that uh, we're aware of what's looming on the horizon, and all of us seem to be taking more of an interest in our town. So um, I, hope, I hope to make a difference. I hope even though I don't have a tremendous amount of political experience behind me, that you see in me what the, uh, my community members did that approached me and asked me to run for this. And uh, for those of you that might like to have a less formal meeting than this, I would invite you to stop by my restaurant either this Wednesday or Friday around 9 o'clock for a far less formal coffee uh, get together. So thank you very much for letting me have this opportunity to get in front of you. Good morning. My name is Jerry Kelly, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out on this beautiful day. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Greg. Thank you to our television audience for viewing this. I, um, I've lived in Tituate for over 40 years. Of course, over the past three weeks, I've lived at the dump, so thank you very much for <laughs> the opportunity not to be there this morning. Um, my, some of my family is here with me, my wife Maureen, my son Max, my son Nathaniel, and Max's girlfriend Becky. Uh, I come from a family of teachers. My wife is a teacher at the Mass College of Art. My son Max is a teacher at the Higashi School in Randolph for profoundly autistic children with profound autism. And my daughter, who's not with us this morning, is a computer science teacher at the Groton School. Um, I've spent my career in institutional finance. I've uh, been involved in strategic planning, bond issuance, uh, bond structure, rate setting, grant, uh, grant uh, application, and I want to use these skills now that I've developed throughout my career to make a great town even greater. Uh, I have been a member of the community for almost 40 years, engaged in youth baseball coaching. Mr. C, you were the apex of my career, <laughs> being able to coach youth soccer. At the time, though, it was bumble ball, Mr. C. Um, great money is very important. You need to acquire it, you need to use it, or, you need, or you'll lose it. There are going to be significant issues that Situate faces as we go forward. And I would like to take these issues and transfer, uh, transform them to opportunities. Uh, I will work full time on this job because I'm retired from the financial services world. Today you will hear much agreement on the issues. Listen closely. It's not whether you agree on the issues, but it's the how, the when, and the why that will be the differentiators. So I thank you all for participating. I look to engage you during the meeting and afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, let me introduce Michael Scott. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Scott, and I'm running for Selectman. Thank you, Greg, and the Citro Chamber of Commerce, and thank you, Nancy. Thank you for everyone who uh, came out, as Jerry said, on this beautiful day. Uh, I am from Situate. I grew up here with my family. I went to Haverly School. I went to Gates Intermediate School. I graduated from Situate High in 1986. I presently work as an attorney at Rockland Trust Company, which has a presence here in Situate. I believe they're a proud member of the Situate Chamber of Commerce, Rockland Trust, for each relationship matters. <laughs> I'm not getting paid to say <laughs> And um, I do have to say uh, to Jim Cantwell and those in the back, you got the cheap seats. I see there's an obstructed view here. It's like being at Fenway Park where you sit behind that uh, banister. But again, th these are important times for Situate. I was happy to get involved. Um, 
after high school, I went to, to, law, or to college down in South Carolina. I graduated from law school in 1994 with the Suffolk Law School. And I went into um, government work right away. I worked for a federal judge. Um, after that job, I worked for the assistant uh, for the district attorney down at Cape Cod. And I've been involved in public service and private sector work um, for the past 20 years. I live in town now with my wife, Maria, who's also an attorney. Um, we live on Elm Street. We have three beautiful daughters. Our daughter, Morgan, is a junior in high school at Situate High. Um, we're very engaged in the community. Morgan was lucky enough to go to the Appalachian Service Project down in West Virginia this summer with other people in high school. Our middle child, Natalie, is 14. She's a freshman at Situate High. And she's off refereeing at a soccer game right now. And our baby, Grace, is 11. And she's in sixth grade at Jenkins and loves to do theater. So we're, we're heavily invested in Situate. We're involved in the community. I'm obviously proud of my family. Um, when you make a choice about who's going to be a next selectman, as Mr. Kelly said, there are a lot of agreement on the issues. And you're not going to hear a lot of disagreement, I don't think, about the projects that Situate needs to move forward on. But you're going to be choosing a person, um, a personality, a character, uh, and a disposition. And you're going to want somebody on your board of selectmen um, who can collaborate with others. It's a board of five. It's not a board of one. Um, and we have a very capable town administrator who actually runs the town. Um, a lot of people don't appreciate that. But the town administrator is paid by all of us to run our town. And the board of selectmen are involved in policy, preparation, policy, execution. <coughs> the selectman is an executive. And you're going to need somebody in that position who is willing to collaborate, willing to work cooperatively with the others. And it's about delivering for people. It's about delivering for people like Henry Galvin, who want to end drug abuse in situ. It's about delivering for people like Lisa Fenton, who want to help community preservation. Thank, thank you. That is the three-minute time. Thank you. <laughs> The good news is we gave you pretty serious time constraint to try to introduce yourselves and to discuss the, the issues that were most important to you. And so for the first question, I'm going to ask each of you if you would like to expand upon your qualifications, your experience, or your um, <coughs> impetus for running for the board. And then in the second question, we're going to give you an opportunity to speak for another two minutes about the specific issues you'd like to address. So this time, um, since I started with Mrs. Curran, I would like to start um, the question answering. Instead of going alphabetically, since you're seated this way, I'll start with Mr. Kelly, and we'll move around the table. Well, I'm back. Um, <laughs> the reason why I decided to run for the board is because I have significant experience, professional experience in financial services. I feel that there's a real opportunity to run the town more like a business. We've got disciplines. We're operating under a, mark, uh, a plan, a town plan, that was, that's 10 years old. The world has changed. It's an opportunity to update, to plan, to prioritize, to sequence, and then to implement. We have many projects that we have delayed, and it's time to address them. But the issue is, how can we afford them? So we've got to look at each. We need to assess where is their grant, not loan funding available. We need to be creative in accessing those grants. And I'm passionate in problem solving, in collaborating, and working as a team member. Uh, Mike Scott said, I'm one of five selectmen. And that's right. Each one of us will have a voice. Each one of us will attempt to implement. Each one of us will collaborate. I have experience that I would like to bring to the management of the town. A good example of what I had in the midst of the housing crisis in 2008, I was selected to lead a team at State Street for the Department of Treasury to manage $225 billion in assets for the Department of Treasury to be able to devise a solution for the housing crisis. 
And our team made more money to the U.S. taxpayer than any program ever run at Treasury. So I've seen very large challenges. I've creatively addressed them, and I've succeeded. So thank you for considering me. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. You can tell lawyers talk a lot. I'm sorry. I've been on my <laughs> but seriously, as an attorney, uh, what the, uh, the town of Citra will be getting in me as a selectman is a trained and experienced investigator, a trained and experienced problem solver. Um, I dig into the issues. I dig in deeply. And part of what I want to bring to the board is that experience. I have the right combination of public sector experience and public uh, private sector experience. Um, as I was trying to say when I was uh, out of time last time, I mean, there's a lot of people who have a lot of great ideas in town. People like Lisa Rafferty bring us ideas about how to make the high school excellent. Um, people like Bill Chapman, Joe Kelly, and Ed Cavell bring us veterans issues that need to be addressed. People like Joanne Ball bring us issues that the seniors need to have addressed. People like David Ball bring us coastal issues, foreshore protection issues that need to be addressed. And individuals like Chuck Croft bring us issues about cell phone service in Sand Hills that need to be addressed. <laughs> and so as a selectman, you need to be open and available to citizens who have issues that need to be addressed. And that's how we, as a board, can formulate policy and then try to execute that policy in everyone's best interests. And it's really about choosing a person who you will trust to do that. Trust to stay involved, trust to have the energy to commit and the time to commit to dig into these issues for all of you. Thank you. I, I assume I'm coming up on the one, so I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually running because members of my community approached me and asked me if I would uh, consider running for selectman. And they did so because of a couple of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, perhaps, is all of our concerns about the very, uh, very costly capital projects that are moving in front of us and how to prioritize and which one we're going to pick. And so that was certainly first and foremost for them. Secondly, they thought that I'd be a good fit in the sense that um, I am a businesswoman, self-employed, have been in the Situate community for 12 or 13 years now, and they thought that uh, perhaps somehow I could work well with the other selectmen in coming to a point where we're making wise, very large financial decisions. Uh, on a more personal level, I chose to run because I wanted to get out of my own comfort zone. For many, many years, it was all about my little business and raising my children. And now the girls are out on their own and my business is established. I have the time. My restaurant is very busy for three months of the year, but not anywhere near as busy for the other nine months. So I would suggest to you that um, I'm extremely accessible because I'm always there. I might even be serving you your coffee, especially the other nine months of the year. And uh, perhaps on a lighter note, maybe the reason I'm running is I missed the memo that said, this doesn't pay a dime. <laughs> so I'm here. I'm here trying to make a difference. Uh, even though it doesn't pay a dime, I'd really like to be part of the board and uh, hopefully be part of some of this decision making, which again, as we've said earlier, is unprecedented in the amount of projects that are right ahead of us. And we need to be very prudent in how we're choosing these capital outlays. So thank you. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, I gave it a lot of thought before I decided to throw my name into the hat for the Board of Selectmen, understanding that it takes an incredible amount of time, commitment, and knowledge and experience to be effective immediately. Um, I'm a graduate from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at the Syracuse University. Um, I received my bachelor's degree in political science, and that's where my passion began, was back there in 1984. Um, so that's why I'm here. I'm here because public service and a commitment to a community has always been a core sense of my being. And I think I've demonstrated that for the past 12 years 
being active for the past 12 years um, in a variety of different ways, not just on the advisory board for the last six years where I spent every Thursday night in the basement of the library going through every budget of this town. It's not fun. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not really fun stuff every Thursday night in the rain, snow, sleet, and hail. But it's important, and it's important to review every line item in this town to understand that there's not a lot of excess out there for us to work with, <coughs> that there are finite funds for us to deal with and approach all the problems going forward. So I want to continue my service to this town constituent because we are a compassionate town and because of all the issues that are before us. I feel that the knowledge that I've gained over the past 10 years and the observations that I have from working with different committees, whether it's just being on the advisory board, sitting through a board of selectmen meeting, talking to citizens, there are opportunities for improvement that I know I can bring forward immediately. Number one, listening. I think we have become a board where we're not always open to our residents. And one of the key differences that I will bring forth is to have weekly open office hours so you can come in and speak to me again and really get back to the basics of serving our citizens. And that's really why I've gotten involved. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A quick sidetrack. The coffee has arrived. <laughs> if you want coffee, please help yourself. It's in the wash. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And as promised now, um, I'm going to begin with Mr. Scott, and we're going to take uh, give you another two minutes to talk about specifically your top three areas of concern in town as you perceive them and uh, what you. Uh, how you feel about what needs to be done about those issues. Um, and I'm sure that we're going to have an opportunity as we go forward with the questions to touch on each of those areas uh, along with the, another sort of broad opportunity for you to speak of them. And again, Mr. Scott. Thank you very much. Um, it's always hard to prioritize things when there are so many issues that need to be addressed. Um, issues such as the needs of our seniors. Uh, as a, a nation and as a community, we need to recognize that the senior population is growing um, more and more every decade. And how to balance the needs of the seniors against the needs of the children. Um, the two big cohorts at opposite ends of life. And that's a challenge for Situate. Um, we have a middle school project coming up which I support, we need to replace the gates and the new school. But we also have to address the needs of our seniors. Can you speak up? Yes, I'm sorry. I will try to speak up. Um, public safety is an issue that needs to be addressed as well. So my top three priorities would be schools, seniors, and public safety. All three of which need a new structure, which is a capital project which cuts into our ability to operate the town. The normal operating costs of a town cost a lot of money, and then you're gonna throw a capital project on top of that, that's a huge challenge. And those are challenges I'm willing to face as a selectman and willing to get in there and get involved. Uh, it's not gonna be easy, and it's gonna require all of us to uh, cooperate and come up with a plan. So seniors, public safety, and schools. The three biggest challenges that I think are facing Situate um, are certainly, uh, first and foremost, the fact that our tax revenue comes 95.5% from the bus and 4.5% from a commercial uh, industrial base. I really think that we as a board need to look at how we expand that commercial base. Uh, that's, that's probably the most important before we continue um, with all of the capital projects that we have on the horizon. I agree that uh, Gates Middle School, which we've already spent a considerable amount of money to get to the point where we're at, appears to uh, be going forward. Uh, I think that will ultimately be up to us. But it's not for a moment do I think that we couldn't use a school that's over uh, to be use a new school, rather, and that Gates School is 100 years old. And uh, I guess it costs about four times as much as other schools to operate because of energy and efficiencies and all of that. 
There is so much that we have to look at. The, the elderly is key for me as well. The fact that we really don't have a senior citizen, uh, senior center for our elderly is just unconscionable for a town of our size and uh, wanting to bring in quality of life and recognizing too that the elderly are the fastest growing uh, facet of our population while our school number, our school age kids numbers are dwindling the numbers of our elderly are growing and we really need to take a look at that. And by no means do I want to minimize uh, some of the other issues that are not capital outlays that are, 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 uh, are heroin and opiate problem. They certainly need to be addressed as well. But in order of the three biggest challenges, definitely increasing our tax base, looking into rezoning, Right now, only 3% of the land in Situate is zoned for commercial. I'm sure that's nothing is easy anymore, but somehow we have to go back to the boards on that. And uh, accord according to the report, it's time? It's time. Okay. I'm sure we'll have to talk more about that. <laughs> it's difficult to be concise with so um, many issues before us, and they're complex, so it's not easy to get through it in 90 seconds. Um, the top three issues for, for us facing us today, um, obviously, are public facilities, um, but also how are we going to pay for them and setting out a strategic course to actually finance these. And as I said earlier, um, our resources are, are finite, quite frankly, $60 million a year, give or take a couple of million here and there, depending upon what the state de decides to give us every year. Um, so that's the number one challenge, is really working through those budgetary issues and prioritizing all of these uh, projects in front of us. And water. We have to remember that water is a basic resource for us. The board made a terrific decision last year, taking out a $22 million bond while borrowing was good, um, to start to address our groundwater issues. That was a terrific step forward. But we also have to continue to evaluate the resources that we have to tap into more water as more development comes into town. So how do we be creative? How do we work and leverage some of the alternate methods that we've already used from an energy perspective and also evaluate one of our greatest resources, which is sitting right behind us, the ocean? Desalinization projects that are taking place in other cities across America. We need to be creative to address some of these solutions. And then obviously economic development and how do we really focus on developing the core villages within Situate, North Situate, let's tap into that sewer so we can continue to grow business there. And how do we increase our marketing efforts to get more viable and dynamic businesses down here in the harbor? This is our most greatest resource. We need to leverage that. And I would like to leave the town to help do that. Nancy. <coughs> Coming up with the top three issues is a difficult task. Overlaying all of them is how do we afford these? The taxpayers of Situate have broad shoulders, but we're, we're weakening those as we go forward with the amount of tax burden that we put on them. The maximum amount of money that Situate can issue according to S&P in bonds or new debt is $200 million. That would be a $2,000 increase on the average taxpayer within Citra. Untenable. The top three things that I would address would be education, I'm not running the school committee, <laughs> coastal management, and the senior veterans center. The middle school vote is coming up on December 3rd, and then the ballot vote in January. This is an imperative. We have a 98-year-old school. The new school is going to give us a tremendous opportunity for interdisciplinary learning. However, we'll come back to the funding. The target funding is 43% grant from the MSBA. We got less than 30% because of the Connecting Performing Arts Center. Why didn't we appeal that to get the 43%? The elementary schools are next on the docket. We've got Deb Donovan sitting in the front row that used to be the principal of Wapatuck. Almost 50 years old, this school. Coastal management is the year that we breathe. The cost to fix the revetments, the jetties, the seawalls is over 60 million, probably close, closer to 100 million. We must access federal funding in order to repair that 
so don't, we don't become Venice, Italy as a town. And finally, the senior center must be combined with the veteran center so we can access veterans administration funding. The 2,200 veterans that we have in town, many of them are also seniors. And 60% of the population of Situate by the year 2017 will be over 60 years old. So those are three of the issues. If you gave me another half hour, I'd go through the next 15 hours. <laughs> <laughs> This is a question from the chamber and it dovetails very nicely with many of the questions that are here on the table. And uh, the chamber works specifically to increase the number of businesses in town and to assist local businesses in thriving and growing. Um, what would each of you do to encourage business growth and success in town? And do you think or why do you think it would work? And we will begin with Ms. House. It definitely needs to be done. Um, it, again, the, I started to allude to this particular study, and we paid the town paid twenty three thousand dollars for the first phase of this. And I would suggest that if we're going to ask a, uh, the Mass the Metropolitan Area Planning Council to do a study like this, that it might be wise if we listen to some of the recommendations. And some of the recommendations that they made were uh, certainly to try to entice new businesses to come here, particularly if we could develop something along the, the uh, Route 3A border, number one, also the Greenbush area. They found that there were many un underutilized parcels of land over there, some coming up from, for auction. Uh, it is a little difficult, and they did mention this as well, because of the proximity of Situate being not so close to major highways, but certainly there are ways to do that and incentives for us to bring other businesses. I don't know if any of you read the article in the Mariner the other day, or the Patriot Ledger, excuse me, about this building and about selling this building, uh, the town selling this business back to generate some commercial revenues. I'd like all of you to consider that. Uh, right now we have this beautiful property that is not creating any revenue at all. It's got a prime location. Uh, I certainly would have all of you take a look at that article. It was in Thursday's paper, I believe. But it's these kinds of smart, prudent, analyzing the data that we have now, listening to the people that we pay to give us direction, and uh, expanding upon, right now we have about 235 acres of land that hasn't been developed, that could be developed with very little environmental impact. So I encourage all of you to take a look at this and uh, recognize that it's, it's, it's necessary. It's not a nice thing to do. It is a necessary thing for the town of Situate to do, to look at. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> time. <laughs> but I wouldn't want someone to do it to do this. Oh. Sure, thank you. Um, we have a terrific economic development committee um, in town today. Uh, one of the things that I noticed recently in reviewing, um, preparing, uh, is that we really don't have representation from our chamber from the different villages on the EDC committee. So one of the things that I would like to change is to make sure that there's proper representation on that board so that the interests of each of the villages are members of that board because we've got a terrific smart committee going forth, going out and getting the MAPC study and taking that data, but also listening to the experienced business owners who work every day here in Situate, who have faced those challenges. So again, my experience is just bringing folks together and really being smart about how we're utilizing the knowledge that already exists in this town and improving it. And I think that's very important. Marketing. Um, we should have a marketing budget to bring more folks into town. But with that, we need to be prepared to um, service those folks. Our public facilities in the harbor are atrocious. When I go visit other small towns, we have there are terrific public facilities so people can use restrooms. The roads are clean, the sidewalks are clean, there's plenty of trash cans, simple things like that that we need to focus on to have people keep coming back and bringing their business to situate. Um, so those are three of the smaller things that I would work on. And also work on 
um, with our state representatives to get more signage. Nobody even knows where Situate is anymore. We're becoming a drive-by town. You drive down through 3A and go to Hingham, go to Rockland, go to Norwell. Well, what about us? This is a gem, and we need to market it appropriately. So those are things that I would work to help improve um, the economy here in Situate, Nancy. Thank you. Obviously, economic development is an issue in town. Uh, we, have, as Laura said, we have some great members of our economic development commission. The study, however, was business as usual: more restaurants, more B and Bs. Really, not any kind of insightful seismic change in the town. The facts are, we're eight miles off Route Three. That's going to be a deterrent to people locating here. However, we can no longer afford the beautiful green space of Route 3A. It must be developed. But the Sitwick Town Forest is owned by the Commonwealth, by the state. So we've got to implore them to be able to develop. And what do we put there? Well, somebody's going to put a Wegmans on the South Shore. Why not us? Um, and grow out from around that. Beth Israel is eventually going to open a Beth Israel South. They have it west, they have it north, eventually south. Why not us? As we take a look at the building in which we're sitting, Pier 44, I don't support selling it because that's a one-time uh, revenue gain to the town and obviously ongoing property taxes. Reach out to UMass Boston and make this their Graduate Center of Marine and Environmental Studies. The advantage of that is the avoided cost of consultants as we begin to embark upon our coastal management endeavor and the multiplier effect on our economy. The last thing I would do is tourism needs to be built up here. We need to be more like Kennebunkport, Maine, or Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Cold Parkway is the most beautiful parking area in the Northeast. So what we need to do is develop a new village in Cold Parkway and across the street on town-owned land put in a parking garage. Start to think outside the box, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I, I grew up in North Situate, and it basically looks the same as it did in the 1970s. North Situate Village is in need of a facelift. The jobs in this country are headed towards health care because our aging population. And Situate needs to tap into the health care industry and make Situate a destination for health care providers. People should not be driving to Cohasset for Cohasset Pediatrics. People should not be driving to Cohasset for Cohasset Eye Healthcare. We have great healthcare services here in Situate now, and we can expand upon that, particularly in Greenbush. Let's think about Greenbush and how we have a medical facility there. We have uh, a couple of nursing homes in that area, and Greenbush needs a facelift. Remember, the T came in, they started the train again. Uh, we need to work in that area to get that to be a business development center. Uh, North Situate Village is in need of a facelift. And Situate Harbor could always be updated. It's, it's much different than it was when I was a child here, and it's, it's really beautiful. But as Mr. Kelly said, Cole Parkway needs to be redone. I'm not sure I'm ready to develop Cole Parkway. I'd make it a better parking lot, and I'd start charging people for parking there overnight. You might see that there are a lot of electric utility trucks there overnight, a lot of campers there overnight. I'm not sure the town's getting any revenue from the use of that space. But business growth is important. The chamber is a leader in that area. We need to support people like Bill Logan and Victor Milligan, who are on our Town Economic Development Commission, in their efforts. And when they propose ideas, they actually go somewhere and they don't just die on the cutting room floor. So we appreciate the chamber hosting this event and bringing business growth to the public eye. Because as all of us have said, we can't live on the tax base we're living on and do all these major capital projects. We're going to croak the residents and people are going to leave. Thank you very much. Well, as you can imagine, a fair number of questions from all of you who are here have to do with the areas of coastal protection and um, particularly uh, what can we do to follow on the $4 million that we've received from the state 
is do you have any ideas to where we could go for more money and also how you might propose to make uh, ease the tax burden <coughs> for the coastal residents as opposed to having them carry the full share of that so uh, we will start with Mrs. Curran, um, and if you'd like to talk a little bit about what you think about the plans for coastal one. Sure. Sure. Um, so this is probably the most complicated issue that we face um, because of the mixture of private and public ownership. Um, there's a lot of debate over whose responsibility it is to repair those calls. There's no doubt that we as a community need to come together and collaborate and bring the parties to the table to come out with a strategic plan. In other coastal communities along the East Coast, they're facing the same thing, and they have a strategic plan. We know that we have $60 million worth of assessed issues that are all categorized along the coast in red, green, and yellow. That's been done. But what hasn't been done is no one has taken that report and gotten to the next step and outlined a strategy to address it. Can we bear that burden on by ourselves in situate? Absolutely not. It's too big, it's too large. Out of our operating budget, the town administrator has allocated $200,000 annually to continue to try to chip away, but we can't just chip away at the issue. We have to have a strategic plan. We have to continue to lobby to FEMA and to get mitigated money, but we can't sit back and wait either. So my proposal is to come together at the table and really come with a strategy so that we can continue to advocate at the state and federal level. I mean, we've got Winthrop on the North Shore getting a $19 million funding project, and we get four. So we need to be better advocates for our town. So working with our state representatives, our U.S. senators, has to be in conjunction with also us coming together with a plan and prioritizing which walls to fix first. We have the data and we need to have a plan of action. So that's what I hope to do and bring to the board is to lead that plan and bring those parties together so we can continue to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Coastal protection and coastal management is probably the largest issue confronting Central. Um, Representative Jim Cantwell uh, was able to secure $4 million in uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts funding, half of which was grant and half of which was low interest loans. In order to be able to address 790 feet of seawall on Oceanside Drive, it's a beginning. Uh, it's the first step in a very long journey. Somebody like David Ball is a tireless advocate for this, and I commend him and his fellow members of the Sedgwick uh, Coastal Coalition. We must address seawalls, we must address revetments, jetties, dredging, estuaries. There, it, at 60 million, it's a start. The cost is probably going to come in at 100 billion. The town did a great job in hiring a new coastal resource officer, Nancy Durfee, and if any of you have, uh, can meet her, you will be renewed in your optimism about the future for the coastline of Sichuan. We must secure federal funds. We can't do it locally. We can't do it based upon the individual homeowner, but we can get some from the Commonwealth. Getting the federal funds are from specific agencies and specific acts. And in order to access that, we must retain a consultant or a government relations firm in order to find the money. Other firms along the East Coast have, we have not. It's time to stop doing business as usual. We need to raise the profile of coastal issues in town. In 1990, the selectmen appointed me to the Coastal Zone Management Commission in Situate. I was 22 years old. Does anybody even know what the Coastal Zone Management Commission is? It doesn't exist in situ anymore. It's really a state agency. So I don't know what happened in the interim, but people like David Ball need to be supported. We need to amend the town charter, in my view, and create a formal either beach commission or coastal commission or some amalgamation of that type of body. So we have appointed members to a real board that brings real issues to the attention of the town. 
The DPW in situ does phenomenal work. They are challenged beyond the normal highway worker that might be inland. They have coastal issues to address. As a Department of Public Works, I think we put too much on their plate without enough resources dedicated towards it. It's an incredible expense. In all reality, it's an operating expense. This isn't a capital project. These are regular recurring costs. These are like roads and bridges. So I don't know how we think we're gonna fund this through some capital borrowing of $60 million. Somehow, we need to get the political will behind funding seawall construction, foreshore protection as a regular budget item in the Department of Public Works lineup. It's an infrastructure that needs regular operating funding. And that's a huge proposal because that's very expensive. But that's how serious and how critical it is to situate. Without foreshore protection, this town is not even half of what it is. Nobody would come here anymore. Uh, the beaches wouldn't exist. The homes would all be wiped out. And so we can debate uh, to the end of the day whether we should have ever built those seawalls back in the 30s and 40s like we did to allow those neighborhoods to spring up. But the reality is we did. And we can't just fold up our tents and move to Hanson. <laughs> I think of all the complicated issues uh, that we're facing, the four of us up here are probably most uh, in concert on this issue. It is not a question of uh, would we like to do this, but a question of we must do this. And I think if there's one area that we can improve, it would be the communication and the education of all of us to realize that this is not a coastal versus interior issue. It is all of our issues. Situates, the integrity of Situate, uh, I would venture to say as well, of many, many of our tax dollars come from the tourism that we have in the summer. All of that would go away in the event that we are not uh, investing in our foreshore protection and keeping Situate, the beautiful town that it is, and protecting it. We right now have 22 miles of coastline. Two homes are impacted by the issues that we're talking about. I think the Coastal Coalition Committee is doing a great job in taking all of these separate beach communities that were previously separate and bringing them as a cohesive unit. They're working together to be a strong voice in government. But we, first and foremost, as a town, we need to recognize that this is not a, it is not a coastal versus interior issue. It is all of our issues, and it has trickled down uh, to our police department, and every facet of our community is dependent upon having a strong, strong uh, foreshore protection plan. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm the first to use the wild card. Uh, this is an enormous issue. I agree that with uh, with Mike Scott that we've got to have an operating budget to maintain our coastal protection, but we have to have a capital budget to repair it. We've avoided it for far too long. The toes on the revetments are, are, are shifting, and if in fact those toes shift further, the revetments are going to become a rock pile in the Atlantic Ocean. We cannot delay this any longer. It's a great... That's 30. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> when it's a commercial in the middle of your favorite. <laughs> yeah, it's just endless, but when you're trying to discuss important issues, it really is not a lot of time. Um, I'd like to move on a little bit to a different situation. All of you expressed concern about the issues for seniors in the community. Um, and and as, as a member of that cohort now, uh, I am particularly interested in that as well. Um, so I'd like to ask each of you what you what your feelings are and what your uh, uh, suggestions are for coming up with a way to deal with not just a, a I think what we want to mention here, and I'm not trying to editorialize, but the senior population is really not one big bunch of people. There are 
the you know the 60 year old seniors as opposed to the 80 year old seniors and all of the different and varying needs in between so it's not it's not a real uh, solidified issue so I would ask each of you uh, if you could address that and we will begin Thank you, Nancy. I think that's a great distinction um, seniors and elderly are not always one and the same I live uh, half of the year with what I would call my elderly in-laws. Uh, they're in their 80s and their health is failing. Uh, my wife's parents are uh, snowbirds. They go to Florida. They're leaving tomorrow, actually. But they live with us from May to October uh, each year. So I see these issues firsthand. My father-in-law is failing. He has Parkinson's. So his needs are different than some of the other seniors in town who might be still active and might be willing to use a senior center on a more regular basis um, for daily activities. Uh, public policy-wise, I think as a state and as a country, we're gonna have to come up with a solution. There is mandatory education for children starting at age five in Massachusetts and probably the same throughout the country. At some point, there may have to be some government allocation on a regular basis to the senior community. I don't know how that would work, but once you get a certain age, there's an appropriation made. See, there are no laws really right now to mandate a place like Situate to do something specific for its senior population. The same way we are mandated to essentially spend two-thirds of our operating budget on children. And believe me, I benefit from that. I have three children in the public schools, but as a public policy issue, that's a huge nut to swallow. Think about that. Two-thirds of our money in the town of Situate goes towards educating our children. I'm not saying that's wrong, but it prevents us from addressing the needs of a larger cohort of people. There's 3,100 children enrolled in the Situate schools. And there's over 5,000 seniors in Situate. Now their needs are different, and I don't want to pit children against seniors, but I'm just trying to raise awareness about this issue, and I don't have the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The senior center, I think, is is really uh, imperative for us to look into a freestanding single structure. I think the fact that we really don't have any place for our seniors at this point in time is really unconscionable. Uh, I don't believe that we've looked into a price tag on what that would cost, and I know here we are talking money, 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 but uh, frankly, that I think I would prioritize having a senior center over some of the other capital projects that we are considering. Right now, we have about 5,500 seniors, and in five years, that number is going to grow to about 8,000. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that is the largest growing facet of our population right now. And to have, have these seniors go to a building that is dilapidated uh, and 163 years old with not adequate parking, et cetera, and have them come here to Pier 44 whenever there's some space, but consequently because it's not really their place, have them not be able to use it when some other meetings take precedent is just not something that Situate should be proud of. So I definitely would like to take a look at if I were to have to choose capital improvement projects, I would certainly put the senior center up above some of the other projects that we are considering. Back in uh, 2007, a, a group came before the town the board selectmen uh, to put together a proposal for a freestanding senior center. I stood on town floor as a resident and as a former school committee member, I wasn't on the school committee at that time, and spoke in favor of that senior center solution because I recognized the needs back then in 2007. Um, it really saddened me that when that vote failed that the fight was given up. And the fight was abandoned because there was no leadership on the board of selectmen to help them navigate through the system and the solutions that could come before the town to resolve this. So I'm sad that that didn't happen because we wouldn't be sitting here in 2014 today, seven years later, still talking about how to have appropriate senior services in Situate. No doubt the existing facility, if you can even call it that, it's deplorable and it needs to be addressed. 
but there's a needs assessment survey that all of us, because I can tell most of the people, with the exception of the Scott kids, are over 45 years old here today. And that survey will go to all of our homes in the next six weeks for us to fill out. Because as Nancy said, it's not just about programming and a place to go, it's about outreach. The new social service worker that we've hired in town, reaching out to those seniors who don't want to come out of their homes. They don't want a facility. So we need to balance the needs. And again, listen to what our residents need, not just go down one path. I don't have the answer right now. I want to support the answer that fits the needs of the entire senior community, both young and old, and ensure that we leverage our regional procurement system to bring in terrific programming so it's cost effective and that is the direction in which I think we need to go in the next couple months as we evaluate this needs assessment survey that comes back. So again, based on data, but also have leadership. Again, all these issues that are before us cannot move forward without leadership. There's a difference between the senior center and senior services. I unequivocally support a standalone senior center in Sedgwick. However, at the same time, I want to commend the staff of the Council on Aging, led by Linda Hayes, that has great staff, great programs, great transportation. You can ask Quincy Ann Cutler about that. A new social worker. But they want to do additional programs, wellness, exercise, counseling, intellectual stimulation, communal meals that you can't do in the current structure. There isn't even parking. There isn't disability access to the facility. You know, what we need to do is encourage our seniors to get older but not get old. <laughs> Great examples are Carolyn and Skip DeBrusque right there. They'll never be old. You know, if we, uh, if we take a look at what the cost may be, let's look at Newburyport at six and a half million dollars to build a new senior center. We already have the land. We, um, we need to co-join this with a veteran center to get funding from the Veterans Administration. We need to reach out to the pharmaceuticals and the insurance companies for naming rights. And at the end of the day, the property in impact, if we don't get any grant funding, will be 50 to $65 on each of our property tax bills. It should be less than half of that. So this is something I strongly encourage everybody to vote for. Thank you. I want to invoke my moderator's uh, privilege, if there is such a thing as a moderator's privilege, um, and just uh, give a little historical reference. 33 years ago, when I was at a much tender age, I was on the Council on Aging. At that time, less than 30 years old, precisely because I didn't want to be sitting here when I was this age, hoping that there was a senior center. But I will tell you that at the time, even after we got the first grants and got the challenge to, uh, you know, we turn the building over, we knew at that moment that that was not going to be sufficient for us. And we really, truly hoped <coughs> at that point, led by Kathy McGowan, that it would, in fact, grow. And the lack of, of, uh, of that progress has been most difficult. So I personally use a voter, thank you all, and I'm sure everyone else here does as well. Um, and while we're sitting here and talking about buildings, uh, obviously at the forefront of, of uh, I've got seven or eight questions here about Pier 44, this building, where you used to be able to have the nicest dinner with the nicest view. Um, what would be your plans? Uh, do you support keeping this as, as a, as a town-owned building? And if so, how would you use it? And if not, how do you feel about the uh, suggestion that it might be time to sell the building? And we will begin with Mrs. Howe. I definitely am in favor of selling this building. Uh, I haven't really thought uh, about the use, obviously, to whoever uh, we could reap the, the best money from would be where we go with this. But clearly, we have a beautiful place in a prime location that could be generating some kind of money to increase our tax base. And there's no one up here that disagrees with the fact that 
a 4.5 commercial tax base just isn't sufficient to support all of the things that we want going forward. It, it almost feels, and I'm sure I'm stepping on somebody's toes to say it, almost feels that since we purchased this building, we're trying to find ways to use it. Um, and that's definitely, I don't think, what was ever intended. Um, and, and clearly, I would be behind any, any, uh, anyone that would say, let's go forward and sell this building and try to, uh, try to generate some income from the building instead of having it be an expense and an underutilized expense at that. Thank you. I support um, making the best financial decision for this building. I really don't know why we bought it, to be honest with you. Um, because it is a terrific resource and source of revenue for our town. Um, if we could go into a lease agreement with somebody to put their business here and generate some revenue with that, with, with various, whatever, um, if it's a restaurant or something, so people can continue to enjoy the facility and the view, but also that situate could um, reap the benefits of a percentage of revenue and also obviously from a tax assessment aspect. Um, I don't think we should be in the business as a town of running a business. We're just not set up to do that in an appropriate way. Um, so I'm open to the solution that is on the table. There are some restrictions because the, the, the building was bought with MBTA litigation money. So I don't think it's going to be as easy as we all think. Um, so some of those issues need to be resolved, um, but certainly um, am open to selling the building for a more um, profitable revenue to come into the town. Thank you. I think that it would be nice to think that we can sell the building if the building was acquired with mitigation funds from the MBTA and there are restrictions on the sale and use. And the... Um, the town selectmen have approached the MBTA to get relief from that, and it has not worked to this point. I think that we should use it for educational purposes. As I <coughs> stated in my opening remarks, this would be an ideal marine and environmental study center here. And the obvious choice would be University of Massachusetts at Boston and reaching out to Chancellor Keith Motley. But if it's not for them, there's Woods Hole, there's BU, there's MIT. We've got Stellwagen Bank right offshore here. So start to use this thing to benefit the town in the most appropriate way. Now this will not increase the property ta tax revenue to the town, but there will be an economic multiplier from the faculty and the graduate students that will work and live here. So I would uh, reapproach the MBTA I would investigate the permitted uses of it, and I would aggressively pursue uh, the educational development of this facility. Thank you. I've had a lot of personal memories in this building. Um, my father was a bartender here for a lot of my youth growing up. We've had a lot of high school graduation parties here. Um, so it was sad to see Pier 44 close as a private restaurant. I agree with Mr. Kelly. There's probably a public use restriction on this structure now. It has to be put to public benefit. Um, so an education facility would be great. I know we were proposing something on the Driftway a few years ago and that fell apart for whatever reason. But we need to support our fishing industry. Now, this was a town that was founded on fishing and shipbuilding three, four hundred years ago. And it would be wonderful to put some sort of educational facility here. It would probably have to be a state institution that was involved in marine study, oceanography, uh, things of that nature. Things uh, and areas of study that would support um, our fishing industry that is, as we all know, dying. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be the answer for our fishing industry, but it would be something that would be a business economic development opportunity that wouldn't bring in tax revenue, but would have those collateral business benefits of bringing people to the waterfront. And therefore, they would patronize our businesses that are on the waterfront uh, and go to our restaurants and purchase goods at our stores. So anything that brings more people to this part of town would be a plus for the town. And it is such a, a precious sight. I mean, look out there. There's really, 
aren't many places in the world where you can have this type of prime real estate um, for development. So we, we need to be smart about what we do with this property. It's, it's precious to all of us who love Situa. Thank you. questions here from uh, people who are here today uh, that basically want to know what plans you have that might bring short-term immediate relief to the town for its tax burden. Uh, and we will begin with short-term immediate relief for our tax burden. <coughs> well, the board of selectmen don't have any um, control over adjusting the tax rate um, so other than that it's how we manage the revenue that we have from the tax rate that exists today proposition two and a half you know moderates the percentage of rate increase that the town can apply um, so um, what i will do is to ensure that the projects that come before us that they're well thought out that they are most moderate and economic in scope, so the burden of us is as little as possible. Unfortunately, with only 4.5% of commercial base, the burden rests on us. So unless it's looking out and bringing in federal funds or state funds for projects where they can apply, really the, the ability for the Board of Selectmen to impact the tax rate on our citizens um, is is really what it is today is is working within the proposition two and a half law which is a great law that maintains our taxes that doesn't allow it to go any greater than two and a half without putting it out to you the voters to make that choice and that's um that's my answer thank you <laughs> mr short-term immediate relief is a dream, not a reality. Uh, we're, we have these projects that we're working upon. What we need to do is to minimize what the expenses that we're going to occur going forward. How do we do that? Well, a good example is as we embark upon these projects, we, we study every line item. We make sure that they're necessary. I was here the other night uh, for a presentation for the new public safety center. The cost is going to be $16.2 million. The last two line items there were contingency. So that means that you're not holding your vendor's feet to the fire. You're building in 5% as a, as a cushion. That's $800,000. We have the same thing on the middle school. We can't continue to operate that way. We must aggressively pursue funding that's over external to the property taxes that are going to be levered. Um, that's grant money. There are many private foundations that have what's called purpose-based investing. So the programs that we're going to develop in town, we should reach out to them for financing in addition to the federal government grant financing, the Commonwealth financing, and our local taxes. Municipal finance and taxation is governed by the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. <coughs> and we have a very smart accountant in town now, Mrs. Holt, who can help us with that. As far as immediate tax relief, it's easy on the state level to talk about tax cuts. We're going to cut the sales tax. We're going to cut the income tax. You know, with the property tax in situate, it's hard to say I'm going to cut the property tax because that's a function of our entire tax base. And the way we get tax relief as residents on our residential property levy is to increase our commercial and industrial tax base. I'm going to suggest um, we develop North Situate a little bit more. People may know there's a 200 unit apartment complex plan for Route 3A near the new public safety building that just came out on Tuesday. Those people taking a left need to pull into North Situate to buy their wares and not go into Cohasset. 
because if you put 200 units on Route 3A, low-income housing, that's a lot of customers. That's a lot of tax revenue for situate. And we need to make sure they stay in situate to shop. We also might want to look at the Community Preservation Act. That's a hot potato. That's a 3% levy year after year on our taxes. That can be lowered. I'm not suggesting it be eliminated and revoked, but that would be immediate tax relief. I'm answering the question. Immediate tax relief is you lower it from 3% to 1.5%, 1%. You get some money back that way. And again, that's a push and a pull. You don't want to alienate people, but if we want to do major capital projects and upgrade our infrastructure, we might have to put a little less into that trust fund for preserving our open space and our historic sites. Thank you. The short-term relief is a that's that's a tough question. I thought more of receiving this question first navigated it very well. <laughs> if you will. It, it is very hard uh, when we're working with government. Is anything immediate? Um, we it isn't, and with the restraints and constraints that we have, uh, it is difficult to use that adjective immediate. I would agree with Mike that an unpopular, perhaps, uh, place to look is the CPA. Uh, it was suggested in the Situate Economic Development uh, report that we have right here that, again, I would encourage all of you to look at, that maybe that would be a partial solution to lower it from the current 3% to 2 or 1%. Uh, our, tax, our taxes, we all have said the same thing. We keep throwing out the same number because they are what they are, and that is 95.5% on you, the homeowner. And um, it's just, and that all comes from your personal property and your real estate. And that just can't be changed in a heartbeat. Uh, and we need that to sustain our operating budget mm -hmm. as well, even before all of these capital outlays. So immediate relief, I would say uh, prioritize take a look at the capital improvement projects that we have booming ahead of us and either put them on hold as we try to, if that, that's a radical, that's a radical explanation, but put them on hold as we try to create a, a more commercial and industrial tax base to create more revenue. Or at the very least, stagger the timeline, which I'm sure that we're doing now with our, uh, our development chart and everything and the weighted criteria that we have to put these projects on. But it's, it's tough. Uh, that's a very difficult question, immediate relief. Can I use my card? Yes, you may. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would not advocate for reducing the CPC from 3% to 1.5%. Um, I've thought about it in the past, but it's a terrific resource for us to do capital projects. We repaired the lighthouse seawall and protected the lighthouse last year with CPC funds. So I, I ca caution us to be careful with, with uh, making suggestions to reduce um, a revenue stream, if you will, that we've already voted on and, and put forth in order to address some of these other issues, affordable housing, historical, and recreation, in addition to open space. Um, it's tough, but I would not advocate to reduce that. Well, that was an excellent segue to the next question, um, which is uh, also from the audience, uh, would you be in favor? of reducing or eliminating the CPC surcharge. <laughs> so that was a very nice segue. The CPC, when it was originally devised, was 80% match from the state. We're now at a 30% match from the state. So the economics have changed dramatically. Having said that, the CPC allows us to have the situation in which all of us want to live. The open spaces, the <coughs> historical preservation, the recent acquisition of Crosby's Farm out in the West End. Um, it brings a tremendous benefit to the town. Um, I think that there are enterprise funds in this town that must be reviewed and, and we must determine whether we continue with them as segregated funds or whether they're part of the general fund. 
The Waterways Fund is one. CPC is another. So we, it's not just CPC, but it's all the restricted funds that we must review, analyze, and determine whether they're still appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Thank you. One of my faults is I try to be painfully reasonable. And if you're going to be asking the taxpayers to fund $100 million in capital projects, I don't know how we can't come up with some creative ways to give them at least some tax relief. So I would look closely at lowering the levy from 3% to something less than 3%. It only makes sense. In my view, it's, it's reasonable. That doesn't mean it's going to be permanently at 1% or 1.5%, but it's going to carry us forward. We need to make concessions. And we can't, I'm not suggesting at all that the Community Preservation Act was not a good idea. It's excellent. It's done all the things that Mrs. Kern said and more. It's going to help us with open space. Community housing is an issue. But with these huge capital <coughs> projects and this borrowing that's going on, I don't know how, as a select board, we can advocate and drive policy in one direction, but be closed-minded to looking at giving relief in other directions. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. I wholeheartedly agree with Mike. Um, the, at its inception, the CPA was a great idea, um, but where we're standing now, uh, I'm looking at this little chart that scares me, which is our, the average tax bill from 2006, and this only goes to 2013, so we still, this is well before any of these large projects were factored into this. The average tax bill went from slightly over 4,000 to, in the year 2013, slightly over 6,000. Again, before any of these large projects that we're talking about. So do, do I think it would be a great idea to just entirely get rid of the CPA Act? No, I don't. But I think we need to consider all possible means of revenue. And if it means lowering the CPA from 3% to 1%, I certainly think it should be considered, at least, and not just discarded as something that we can't touch. And uh, I would certainly consider all of you to take a look at what the CPA Act is and what we've acquired through it, the good things that we've done. Of course, we've done some good things. Mm -hmm. But again, we're talking about huge capital outlay looming ahead of us. Thank you. Well, you know how I feel uh, <laughs> since I opened it up. Uh, it, I think it's important to understand that the CPC, it, it is a tax, it is 3%, but there are abatements that folks can have and, 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 and receive some relief. Um, and you should take advantage of that and go down to town hall and do so. Um, it's an enormous effort to change a tax rate in this town, whether it's up or down. Um, and I fear that by advocating to reduce it from 3% to 1.5%, that we will get back into that mode of pitting one interest against another. And that is what has caused us to be stalled in so many of the projects that we need to address. I'm not interested in pitting the CPC group against the senior group against the school group. I'm interested in utilizing the resources that we have to move us forward. That CPC money, as I said, not only addresses open space and preserves our watershed, but it also has been instrumental in opening up more recreation fields in town due to a change in the law about a year ago. It has helped us to continue to maintain some of our most beautiful historic structures in town, whether it's Lawson Tower or the Cudworth House or the Lighthouse. And the, we have so many things in town to take care of, that this is a financial resource that we have in place today, and that I think we need to, to just more strategically utilize that money and not use it as an interest-based mode so the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? So whoever comes in front of the CPC and waves their hands the largest and the highest gets the money. No, there needs to be, again, a strategic plan brought together of all the interests in the party. Where do we want to best utilize those funds? And that is what I hope to bring forward, is to bring those parties all together to utilize that tax base in the greatest interests of the town and not just for those special interest groups. Thank you. 
Okay. I saved the best for the next to last, I think. Um, we're just going to start talking a little down and dirty. How high on your priority list is the sewer project? And <laughs> that, I, it really was no good place to put this question. So, um, so it, it, there it is, and, um, and we will begin with Mr. Thank you. Uh, you know, town sewer is a huge luxury. Um, if you think of the world, uh, you know, treatment of sewage and, and brown water and wastewater um, is a major luxury, and it's a huge expense. And as a community, we need to decide how we're going to allocate our resources. Uh, sewer tie-ins, always a hot-button issue. You know, this street wants it, that street wants it, this neighborhood wants it. Why did he get it? Why, why can't she get it? Um, I don't know where it is on my priority list. It's not at the top, to be honest with you. It's one of those uh, creeping expenses. In a perfect world, all of us would be on town sewer. It's more environmentally appropriate um, to treat our sewage collectively. Uh, these Title V systems fail. You know, our own personal sewer systems fail, and it's not environmentally sound. Um, the same way we all have clean drinking water, I suppose we should all have clean sewer facilities. And eventually, I hope as a town we get there. Um, but I'm not going to say it's my top priority. I'm not on town sewer, if anyone's wondering. We have a septic system. Um, it'd be a nice luxury. Um, it'd be another expense. Um, that's, I guess, my response to that. I'll take any individual questions from any personally impacted people on that issue at any time. Thank you. Directing that question more towards uh, putting sores in North Central, I believe, yeah. mm -hmm. as opposed to the money that's already been appropriated. Well, I would say how to manage the needs of the sewer needs of the town. It was there were three very okay. general questions, so I won't I won't attempt to uh, interpret that. But it's basically sewers for the for the rest of the town. Okay. Um, so I know at this point that we've already appropriated twenty two million dollars for uh, cleaning up our water. And, uh, and our, our wells and all of the six wells that we have in place now. And that we've already com completed three of the six phases that we've, uh, that we've been committed to. Uh, it would not be, as Mike said, on the top of my list of priorities when we have so many. Uh, is, is it a good thing? Yes, in a perfect world, would I like to do every one of the projects that's in front of us this year? I absolutely would. Again, it comes down to the priorities and what do we as a town think should take our money first. And uh, I think sewers would not be where I went first, other than I like the fact that we have already done some great things in the uh, three of the six phases and we have three more to go. I think I guess that's going to be on hold for a little bit, the uh, remaining three phases. But again, um, as always, it comes down to the dollars, and uh, it would not be top of my list. Thank you. So it's a constant balancing act, right? Because there are so many issues before us today. Um, so to prioritize, um, what I would ensure is that we're not allowing developers to come into town and hook up to our sewer system prior to the residents. Um, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's right. I also think North Situate needs to be hooked up first before Toll Brothers hooks into the sewer department. Um, so if you want to ask me from a priority standpoint, that is where I stand on that. Um, I also think it's important from a water treatment aspect that we ensure that our engineers there continue to get their certifications updated, that they're trained, and that they receive the newest education in water treatment. So. Those are initiatives that, that, that me and my experience that I can bring to the board. Um, I'm not a sewer expert, but I certainly think we need to evaluate this fairness and equitable fashion and allow the phases to continue. And hopefully, to, I, would, I, would, um, I would stand behind putting North Situate and hooking up because it's already plumbed. It just needs to be hooked up, ensuring that we have the capacity and getting North Situate taken care of so we can continue to develop that in a more aesthetically pleasing manner. Thank you. 
folks, there are realities that we're dealing with here. There are 650 new houses on the boards here in town. You know, assuming that they have normal biological functions, the residents of those, it's going to be a stress on the, on the sewerage system in town. The Toll Brothers have agreed to make an enhancement to the uh, current water treatment plant so as to pay their way. At the current thinking is they're going to be moving ahead of the residents on the list, but the residents won't be disadvantaged because there's going to be an upgrade to the sewage treatment plan to accommodate the Toll Brothers development. We learned at the selectmen's meeting last week that we're going to, uh, we're contemplating 200 new 40B units, apartments, out at the corner of 3A and Manlot Road. That, uh, that unit, they're going to have their own waste treatment site uh, facility on site. We must, if we have any hope of an economic development plan for North Sedgwood Village, we must uh, provide sewer there or else it will not become developed. We need to take a look at what are the options beyond our current water treatment plan. Years ago, there was a study on, on some town-owned land to put a second water treatment plant on the Gulf River. So once again, we need to be creative in our approach to things, and we can't just uh, rest with business as usual. So we're going to ask the candidates uh, to comment on any other topics they wish to address in a short period of time that may have been missed and make a closing statement uh, to leave their most cogent thoughts with all of the voters here today. And we will begin with Mr. Scott. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Greg. And thank you again to the Citro Chamber of Commerce for hosting this candidates forum. It's an important and exciting time and situate. Um, sure, I'm, I'm qualified to be a selectman. I, I grew up here in Situate. Um, I went to law school. I have a law degree. Um, I have a good balance of public sector experience and private sector work. And I was on the Coastal Zone Management Commission here in Situate. I was elected to the Finance Committee in the town of Middleborough where I sat for three budget sessions, very similar to our advisory committee. I was on the Veterans Advisory Council here in Situate uh, a couple of years ago. So I, like the other candidates, I, I think I meet the threshold requirements to be a good selectman. It's really about choosing a person and a personality, I think, at this point. Um, candidly, I think all of us would be great selectmen. Um, and maybe someday we'll all sit on the board together. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think we'd get along fine. I want to tell you why I ran for selectman, though. Um, I didn't touch on it in my opening, because uh, a lot of people are like, well, Mike, you've been involved in town, you coach in soccer, you've been on a couple of boards here and there, you dabble in town politics, you got private life to live like all of us. Um, and really, it's, it's about my passion uh, for people and for situate, um, and what kind of world that we're leaving our young people. And there was a big expression that's still a big expression, it's been around our whole lives, it's, think globally and act locally. And there was a lot of frustration building up in my life over the last couple of years uh, about what's going on in the world. And it appears to me that despite the overwhelming majority of good people that live on this planet and live in America and live in situate, the media is focusing on the bad people and the bad acts. And I can tell you, on the eve of pulling these papers, I was thinking about what was going on in Russia and how a private jetliner was shot down <coughs> by militants fighting for some cause we don't understand. Shortly thereafter, we're seeing images of people being beheaded in a world that none of us understand, but we send our young people there. Our young people have been in the Middle East for 15 years. And so it's these types of thoughts that come to mind when 
that's why I want to run for selectmen. It might not seem time. Sorry, we gave. <laughs> 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 that's what you're going to get as a selectman. <laughs> 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 Seriously, that's you know you might think why is he running for selectman? He wants to be president or senator or something. But we have to act locally first. We are all good people, and we need to overwhelm the bad people with our goodness. And we can do great things in situate. And that's what you'll get with me as a selectman, is someone with passion and goodness and a commitment to this town and its residents. You're all going to be Mr. Kelly. May I stand up, please? <laughs> Can I have my 30 seconds at the beginning? <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is address the, the question that was not answered today, and that was the opiate issue in Sedgwick. And it is substantial. Our attempts to educate and prevent have failed. And what we must do is we must embrace a, a program of treatment of rehabilitation and of recovery. These are our children, these are our neighbors, these are our friends. They have substance abuse disorders. If you read the studies by Dr. Chung, Dr. Kelly, the way we're going to address this is by peer support groups, by not labeling them as criminals. These kids can't, or people, cannot reach out to the police. They've got illegal substances. So we've got to extend the helping hand to these people rather than handcuffs. So that's the one question that was not answered or asked. Um, why am I running? I'm passionate about Sedgwick. I'm passionate about the issues that we confront and the solutions that we can develop. I'm the candidate that's not went to the past. I'm looking to the future. I see each one of these issues as an opportunity to do something differently and better. For me, it's time for a new attitude. I want to collaborate and engage people who live in this town that can be additive to the process. <coughs> Howie Kreutzberg is a great example. Howie led the construction of the Marine Center. There wasn't one dollar, one dollar of governmental, of Sedgwick Town money used in the construction of that. People like Howie need to be engaged in solving our problems as we go forward. I'm going to be a full-time selectman. I'm not going to fit this in between conference calls. I'm a results-driven person. We know what the issues are. We know how we can get to the solutions without breaking your backs with, with tax increases. The reason why I'm running is because all of our money matters. And I hope that I can earn your vote as we proceed forward to November 4th. Thank you. Uh, I've learned so much from the three people that I'm sitting up here with. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned at the get-go, I've not been involved in politics at all before. And uh, it is clear that I have much to learn. And it is also clear that uh, I have the ability from my educational background and things that I've achieved in my lifetime that I would be able to do that. Um, I've learned so much the other night from them. I continue to learn from them as I would from the other selectmen. These are very formidable opponents, and I think you, as the town of Situate, have a tremendous opportunity on November 4th to have uh, four great candidates that you can choose from, in addition to all the other important choices that you're going to make. Uh, it's clear that we have very different personalities up here, and that really uh, could shine through today, I thought, even more so than the other night. And I have had uh, a wonderful experience being part of this, 
win or lose, I will continue to be invested in Situa politics from now on. I stated earlier, too, that I was in a very comfortable sphere that was very limited, and it's my hope now to get out of that now that I've uh, already uh, broken the ice in doing this because this is, as I mentioned previously, this is not easy to be up here. And although the four of us seem to be very comfortable, I'm sure some of us are more comfortable than others. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for letting me be in front of you. I'm sure you'll make a wise choice on November 4th. At this time, I'd like to offer my card two more for sale. And I'm going to <laughs> working together is all about, right? Um, so thank you, Carolyn. Um, why am I running? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that I don't need to say again that I've, I've dedicated my time for the last 12 years serving Situate in a variety of capacity. And I want to take that next step to lead and utilize that knowledge and more, more importantly, the observations that I've made by working on many of these committees and with many of the different men and women in town. This summer, you know, unfortunately attended a couple different funerals and what struck me most was one of a gentleman in Quincy who had dedicated his life to the city of Quincy. And the list of what he did for that town um, was so impressive to me that I thought, well, <coughs> that's what I want to be. I want to continue, I want to have an obituary that says I helped situate for you know, 20 years or so in a variety of different ways because I think that's why we're here. We're here to help one another. We're a community and that's the core of being of who I am is that my goal is to bring folks together to continue to serve you and the, situates, the other situates that are not here tonight to make Situate a better place. I also am running because I think it's time for a little diversity on the board. We are not enough <laughs> There aren't enough women who are involved in a variety of the communities around town. So many women passionately, every day and every night, work on behalf of schools and different special interests. But we need more women to lean in and to get involved and to lead our community. So I pledge to you that I will bring a different perspective and I would like to bring that diversity to the board. I have the passion, the experience, and the knowledge and more importantly, the ability to listen. And it's not just about what I think. And I think that's an important distinction up here today. It's not just what I think and what ideas I think should happen. It's representing you. And it's representing those other folks around Situate. And listening and bringing a collaborative view and a collaborative solution so that your tax dollars are being spent appropriately and responsibly. That's what fiscal responsibility means. That's what transparency means. That's what open communication means. That's why I'm running. I hope you will support me on November 4th. Don't forget it's a separate ballot. <laughs> and connect that dot for more current. <laughs> passion came up quite a bit and that's what I felt here today how fortunate we are to have four people with passion and, and experience and great expertise and knowledge in many areas uh, who are willing to put themselves forward to do the work that has to be done to keep us in business and, and functioning uh, and now I'm going to say thank you to the chamber and turn it over to saying thank you to our moderator, Nancy. <laughs> and on behalf of the Chamber, thank you to all of our candidates for attending today. We appreciate it. I think all of our residents appreciate it. We wish you luck moving forward with the elections. Um, and we hope that you stick around and mix, mix with the guests. Please feel free to ask questions of the candidates um, and help yourself to any of the beverages or refreshments. Thank you very much. Thank you.